بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أب القاسم محمد المصطفى صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين الغر الميامين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome once again, my uh, beloved brothers and sisters, respected viewers. You are watching us live on Imam Hussein TV on T3. Teach, talk, and thrive, inshallah. I am your uh, presenter, Ali Burji, and uh, with us once again, we are honored and blessed to have Sayyid Shabir Girmani. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, before we start, we'd like to um, just remind you, brothers, that um, this show is uh, focused on um, helping us develop social uh, aspects through the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. And who better than Ahlul Bayt to learn from and extract information and uh, moral teachings? Inshallah, we would like to continue uh, our topic from last week. If any of you uh, attended were with us regarding development and we also discussed about economic development and how crucial it was uh, for Islam during, especially um, during the early days where uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, uh, was establishing this magnanimous religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and inshallah today we'll continue with regards to wealth and is wealth the best aid for faith inshallah also, prior to starting, we'd like to remind you that during the second half of the show, we'll open our lines for any of you who'd like to join us and uh, whether ask a question or would like to contribute to our discussion. And also, WhatsApp messaging will be available and the number will be visible on the bottom of your screens, inshallah. Now, um, Sayyidna, we would like to start with regards to um, wealth. Mm. Now, as we said, there's no other than Ahlul Bayt when it comes to referring uh, mm. for guidance. Mm. Now, what um, has Ahlul Bayt taught us about wealth and work? Bismillah. Ahsan, so wonderful question. Now, you said very correctly that our ultimate role models are the Ahlul Bayt They are who we take our guidance from. And um, they are the divine representatives of this complete religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is Islam. And so when we say all of these things, somebody who may not be following the path of Islam or the Ahlul Bayt Salam may come forward and, and ask the question that, you know, this is a pretty big claim. Like, first of all, you're saying that these are the representatives and the role models that you look at for every aspect of your life, number one. And number two, um, you're saying that your religion or your faith is the ultimate uh, religion. So we need to substantiate this. And it would be quite, uh, you know, it would not be complete in terms of an analysis. It would it'd be lacking if Islam did not give us a way of, for example, establishing ourselves economically or making our subsistence and making our sustenance available to us. You know, that's one of the most important parts of anyone's life. You know, today, you go to uh, London, in London, you go to America, you go to New York, you go to LA, you see people working all day, every day. In fact, to the point that People don't have much time for much else these days, it seems like. That's true. And so Islam doesn't necessarily say that's the best way to go about it. It may, be, may say something more balanced. However, Islam does not neglect that because Islam understands, and the Ahlul Bayt have, have commented on, on this numerous times, that in order to live in this world, we must abide by the laws of this world. And one of the, the universal principles of this world is that you need to work hard for your sustenance. It's not just going to come to you while you're seated on, the, on, a, on a prayer mat by itself. Although prayer is extremely important. There's no doubt about that. So coming forward to trying to answer your question more specifically, we have traditions from the Ahlul Bayt, like the ones that we alluded to last week, for example, or in previous episodes, where we talked about this notion that the Ahlul Bayt have told us there are 10 parts of risk or 10 parts of sustenance. Nine of those ten are in tijara, or business, or trading, for example. There are other traditions that tell us, for example, that the best aid to faith, the best aid or assistance or help to the deen is wealth. Na'mal aun ala ta'atillah. The best aid, the best assistance. 
is wealth because it's a tool which we can use to support Islam. Absolutely. This is the crux of this notion. Sometimes in this modern world when people think of wealth, they make it synonymous with materialism. Materialism can be a big problem. I don't deny that whatsoever. And you would find the Ahlul Bayt السلام, in their writings and their teaching, they also cautioned and, ha- and gave hazards against materialism. Have you got any hadith from Ahlul Bayt السلام, with regards to how can you balance this? Uh, for example, if you're a hard worker mm. and you want to earn your halal rizq, your sustenance, and you're earning, mashallah, some a lot, some less, but how can I balance myself so I don't slip to the other side and start being materialistic? Well, we, we all know that Islam does not encourage materialism. Okay. Although you're, you're, you're um, allowed to enjoy certain things in dunya, subject to them being halal, lawful. But how can I balance it so I may not slip, mm. so I don't get fooled by shaitan? Mm. This is a beautiful question that you've asked here, and it's important for a number of reasons. In our modern world, we start to ask people questions and start gauging things in a very material way. What I mean by that is there's some philosophers, modern philosophers in the contemporary era, um, who have actually highlighted this question, that it's called the, the, the question of the 20th century. Mm. And now this question has bled over into the 21st century now as well. And that question is, as soon as you meet somebody in this world who you don't know, a new acquaintance, for example, a new uh, person, someone walking down the street, someone at the mall, somewhere, you ask them the question, what do you do? What do you do? And we're kind of trying to ask, like, you know, are you a doctor, are you a lawyer, an engineer, a businessman, what are you? And based on their answer, we judge every aspect of their life. This is a very new phenomenon. This was, it wasn't necessarily true in the past. Every job had uh, his respected uh, status, mm. for example. Absolutely. But now I'm, uh, I can agree with you that, well, unfortunately, we may uh, label people or you know, belittle them or mm. you know, maybe sometimes unconsciously think little of someone, for example, a doctor mm. and a shopkeeper. Mm. They may both be earning their halal income, providing for the families. You may have a very successful shopkeeper who becomes, sometimes you can have, you know, he may expand and become richer than a doctor. Mm. But still, sometimes the status of the doctor will be higher than Mm. the shopkeeper. Mm. Should that really matter? Or should it matter that the man is working hard to provide a halal income for his family? And obviously, how does he contribute, as we mentioned back with regards to the community, how you give back to your community and Mm. help strengthen your community? Shouldn't that be more important rather than the title of the job? It's a very good point that you bring up. You know, in the past, even in America, for example, maybe a few decades ago, even someone who was, for example, a barber who cut hair, for example, people would look at that and and say, you know, that's a person who's seen the world. He's spoken to so many people. He's provided a service. He's worked honest and hard his whole life. That's a respectable person. Unfortunately, there have been some trends and changes in our world today, unfortunately, some for the negative. That this notion that wealth by any means necessary is still respectable. That if someone has obtained them by... So we need to be very cautious of that. What we're saying here is wealth based on the prerequisite that you've attained it in the proper way. Now, if you attained it in the proper way, after that, then we have a discussion about how is that used, for example. I remember, for example, our, our Imams Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim, were very, very vocal about this. I remember it was Imam, Imam Al-Hadi Ali Salam, I believe, and there was a moment in time where... One of his companions was speaking to him and he said that, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, when you sit amongst this, uh, the dignitaries, you know, because the Ahlul Bayt salam, even the people who are oppressing against them or taking their right, they still understood that the Ahlul Bayt salam had a tremendous power. And that power was they had the, the love, their love existed in the hearts of the people. This is something that you can't buy. Money can't buy this kind of love. This is real. True. Like this is something you can f- you can fear people into listening to what you say. Mm. They may hate you. They may despise you. But true loving someone, and and existing having them in your heart, that's something that Halal Bayt Ali Musalam. It's only earned, yeah. never sold. Exactly. Exactly. And so, this companion says to the Imam Ali Musalam, he says that Yabna Rasulillah, 
you sit amongst dignitaries because they call you to the court, you sit with them, you sit with intellectuals, you sit with the brightest minds of this generation, and you speak very articulately. You speak very courageously, you speak very eloquently, you speak very intellectually. Yep. There's nothing wrong with what you say, you speak better than anyone else there. Now imagine someone, for example, is going into the United Nations, for example, and speaking, or someone's going into one of these, you know, really dignified places in the modern mm. world as the people see it, you know? And so, he was in these gatherings. He said, but Yabna Rasulullah, can I tell you one thing? He said, yes, of course. The Imam Ali is attributed to have said. He said that there's one problem, if I can advise you. He said, yes, sure. He said, the clothes you wear, they're very simple compared to the clothes that other people wear there, in that court. You know, people wear the finest luxury clothes mm. there. And sometimes your clothes are, they seem very worn and torn, and sometimes they, they may even have patches on them, for example. The same way Amir al-Mu'mineen used to patch his Allah. shoes and his clothes and his cloak. To the extent where there wasn't any more space to, to patch again. To the extent again, there was no more space. Subhanallah. This is Ahl al-Bayt Ali Muslim. Now, there were other circumstances for the Ahl al-Bayt Ali Muslim. For example, Imam Hassan Ali salam or Imam al-Radha, maybe we'll send, shed light on that as well. Mm. Where they wore well, good clothes. Perhaps that was to give us another lesson as well. But we'll come to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. So with respect to this, this companion, he says, Ibn Rasulullah, one thing that I could advise you, please just wear some better clothes. It's like someone saying that, for example, to uh, someone down here in, I don't know, um, in, in America we have, for example, like stores like Walmart, for example. Many teens would tell me that, you know, they'd get uh, harassed or if they didn't wear the nicest clothes. You know, sometimes in schools people are the most, they're, they're vicious, you know. And I, I, I hope nobody does that. Bullying is a real problem. It all starts from ignorance. It starts from ignorance. I agree with you. So anyways, this man was saying the same thing to the imam. You're sitting, you're, what you're saying is perfect, but the way you look, your substance is great, but your looks are not matching up with who you're sitting with. Imam Ali Musalam gives him, is attributed to have given him a beautiful response. I'm being very careful with my words because we're fasting, of course, as you, as you know, and attributing something to Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam, is, you have to be very careful with it. In any event, Imam Ali Musalam is attributed to have said, you're absolutely right. If, and he gives a very important if here. He says, what you say is correct. If my value depended on the clothes I wear. Allahu Akbar. Huge statement. Huge, a, a, mm. a statement that is a resounding answer to so many questions. Which we need have. to analyze. A profound one. You know, he's saying, you're absolutely right. If my value depended on my clothes. He's saying that don't get fooled. These people could be wearing the best of clothes. Mm. They could even be wearing silk when Islam, they, were, they should not be if they're a male, be, be wearing silk, for example. They could be wearing gold you know, in Islam, for example. They should not be as a male, be wearing gold, for example. However, he said that just because they're dressed well doesn't necessarily mean that they're good people, that they're intelligent, that they're eloquent, and they're righteous. That doesn't mean that. And just because I'm not wearing the most fancy clothes, I'm not wearing the Gucci, the Prada, the Louis Vuitton, and those, those clothes. Although, we can argue that's not haram. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm not wearing those fancy that Imam Ali is saying. But always remember, my value doesn't lie in the clothing that I'm wearing. My value truly lies in what I do for the world. You know, the Imam Ali Musalam, it is because of his faiz and barakah that the universe exists. We benefit from this Imam. And he's giving us a very important message there. So therefore, in terms of balance, and to go back to your question, in terms of that, materialism is a problem that we need to be very mindful of. We want to encourage people to strive after excellence in life, no matter what that is. Excellence to the highest caliber. And when we strive towards excellence, one may be very wealthy, but they'll know that my value doesn't depend on my clothes. Maybe it's better if I take that extra wealth that Allah has given me and I help somebody else out. Ahsan. You know, six million children, you know, this becomes very real, materialism becomes very real when we think about six million people, children, die every year of preventable causes. Preventable causes. And they would have survived if they had gotten $200 per child. 
they would have survived. That's so sad. $200? What's $200? To save a life? Some of our, you know, our clothing, our, our, our belts, our, our suits, our cars, you know, that's a portion of a payment of a monthly car for some people, you know? And what I'm saying is, I'm saying two things that people may think they're contradictory, but I'm arguing they're not contradictory. They may think that obtaining wealth means materialism. I'm saying no. That's not how the Ahlul Bayt saw it. They were telling and encouraging people to be very wealthy, but to encourage them also to do good with their wealth. If I may say it another way, the Ahlul Bayt many of whom were very affluent through their lives, they were very wealthy, but as they got wealthier, they raised their standard of giving, not their standard of living for themselves. This is a very important point to note. Can you give us an example of the Ahlul Bayt working for sustenance Ahsan. and how they would um, contribute back to society or with that sustenance they would acquire for themselves? Absolutely. So uh, tying in the balance notion that you asked with this question, I'll try to try to combine the two. There's a tradition that we've been told attributed to the Ahlul Bayt uh, attributed to Imam Sadiq salam, where he has said that it is found in numerous traditions that a Muslim should be found in certain states and certain states only. And this has also been highlighted, for example, in the Book of, of Wisdom of Ali Dawood, of the family of Dawood. And the notion is that a Muslim should not be in any state except for three. State number one, they should be in a state of seeking halal livelihood, halal sustenance. The, the righteous legal sustenance as per Islam, they should be seeking that out and working in hard to strive towards that. Number two, they should be in a state of trying to get provisions for the hereafter, working for the next life. Whether that's through salah, through psalm, through different ways, through prayer, through fasting, they should be trying to strive for the next world, state number two. And state number three, they should be trying to, to indulge themselves in the halal pleasures that Allah has allowed. Therefore, the tradition continues and it says that you should spend an hour, at least an extra hour for the halal sustenance, an extra hour for worship, and an extra hour, extra sa'a, or extra time for a halal pleasures of this world. And it continues to say that the last one, the halal pleasures, they give you the energy to perform the first two. Subhanallah, can you get more balance than this? That Islam is telling you to, encouraging you to go after the halal pleasure. What are the halal pleasures? For example, you going out and going, taking a stroll in the park, for example. Going down, for example, you have, mashallah, beautiful parks in London, for example. And go, go check those out. Hyde Park, for example. Nice place to check out, maybe, or with, with the family or with some friends, for example. Mashallah, there's a, I hear there's a very famous, uh, you know, a very big football match that's going on this weekend. Maybe that's a good thing to watch with some friends, gather together and watch sports. You know, sports can be a beautiful thing, a blessing in disguise, if you will, to help keep our youth away from some, some, some not, a, not some of the best activities, to keep them away from those bad activities. Sports helps them on that front. These are all things that Islam has encouraged. And for the hadith, the tradition says that when you do this, when you do this, this will help you do, get the energy to seek a halal sustenance and also give you the energy to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't neglect that. Someone may say that, okay, I'll, I, the halal pleasures, I don't need them. Let me just focus on one and two. Mm. Someone may say that. Islam, under, Islam, who understands human psychology better than the creator of human psychology? Sorry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his divine representatives. No. They know this. I wanted to ask you, um, with regards to balancing things, if if someone said that, you know what, I don't want to work hard to earn a lot. Mm. I just want to earn what I need to survive. Mm. And is a pious man, down to earth, not interested in materialistic things. Is that, how is that seen? According to your opinion, what knowledge we may have mm. from Ahlul Bayt mm. How is that seen in the eyes, metaphorically in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? SubhanAllah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful question. It's a very important question that we need to highlight. You know, you may think it's good for you, it's sufficient for yourself. Ahlul Bayt in terms of their traditions, give us a different perspective. You may think this is enough for me, this is enough for my, my immediate family, but the Ahlul Bayt take a very different approach. They tell us to struggle 
and work hard. We have traditions from the Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim that tell us that a person who goes out in search of halal sustenance for themselves and their family, it is greater than the person who goes out in the struggle in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imagine, someone is trying to put their life on the line, someone is seeking halal sustenance. The person seeking halal sustenance has a higher, higher regard on that front. So to answer this question, this is very important to note. Furthermore, with respect to a tradition comes to us that's attributed to Imam al-Baqir <coughs> A man comes after the passing of his father, Imam Sajjad Ali mm-hmm. A man comes towards and he wants to visit Imam al-Baqir. He's in Medina. He sees Imam al-Baqir from a distance working in the field. In a state where he has a, a, a servant or a, someone who's working with him on both sides. Young, younger men. Imam is a bit older now. He has one hand on one side and one hand on the other for support. And the Imam Ali Musalam is sweating profusely. He's sweating because the heat is so intense at that time. And he is working hard in the fields. The man says that I wanted to, I saw Imam al-Baqir in this state and I wanted to advise him that you're going after this dunya, you're going after this world, this material gains. You're an Imam. You're a leader of the Muslim world. You're doing this? And then, uh, and then I tell other people that they shouldn't go after the worldly desires? So I approached him, the man says. I approached Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. And when he approached him at that moment in time, he says, Ya Abdullah Rasulullah, you in this state, working in the field, trying to get money, trying to get the worldly gains? He said, what would you say if Malakul Maut comes to you at this time? The angel of death comes to you at this time. What would you say if your life was taken from you in this time? He's trying to get the Imam to think maybe the Imam is doing something embarrassing. Mm. The Imam supported himself again. He stood up with the help of his supporter. He stood up and he looked the guy right in the eye and he says, if the angel of death took me in this state at this time right now, I would die in a state of ibadah, in a state of worship. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He said, I would die in a state of worship. The man says, I wanted to advise the Imam, the Imam advises me counter. In response. And the, that's the reality of the matter. Hard work and seeking risk for myself and my dependents is ibadah, is worship. Oh, simple okay. as that. We'll leave that on that keynote that. Uh, Hard work is ibadah. Inshallah, uh, dear brothers and sisters, respected viewers, we're going to just pause for a short break. And in the meanwhile, stay with us. See you right now. to the show, uh, dear brothers and sisters, respective viewers. For any of you who just uh, joined in, um, you're watching us live on Imam Hussein TV and this is T3 Teach, Talk and Thrive, inshallah. Um, now I would like to inform you um, that uh, the lines are open for any of you who would like to join in and ask uh, respective Sayyid the question or contribute to our discussion. Um, the uh, phone number is 0203-515-0199 and there's also the WhatsApp number available on the lower bottom of your screens for you to, if you'd like to text and inshallah um, I'll be informed uh, by the EAPs. Now, um, before we went to the break, we've come to a beautiful conclusion that through the teachings of Ahlul Bayt salam, we learn that working hard is a form of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now I come to ask Sayyidina the question. If I'm a person who earns my halal living and what I earn is enough for me, do I, why do I have to work harder to earn more? It's, it's a really important question because people may talk about contentment and things like this. Mm. And there's a, there's a distinction that should be drawn between contentment on a personal level versus contentment on the societal level. Because in Islam, we are told that, for example, we as followers of Al-Bayt or Muslims in general, if we are just concerned with ourselves, you know, just me, my immediate family, my you know, household, me, 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 
And I'm not concerned about my neighbors, for example. My neighbor goes to sleep hungry, although I am satiated and I've eaten. That's a big problem Islamically. In Islam, the concept of neighbor is not just right left, like in modern world, for example. Islam, my neighbors are 40 houses right, 40 houses left, 40 houses in front and back, east, west, north, south, all covered. Sometimes you wonder, how am I going to do this, you know? Yeah. But that's the responsibility you have. But Islam is not just about prayer, it's about practical practice and implementing what you believe. So if that person goes hungry, I'm liable, I'm responsible for that person. So what that means is, if there's a brother or sister of mine who's going to sleep hungry in my neighborhood, in my vicinity, furthermore, if you take this locally, we'll take this to a higher level, nationally, no, further than this, globally, there are many of our brothers and sisters who are in other parts of the world who are suffering at a very high level. We may be content for ourselves, but are we content with their suffering? That's a beautiful observation. So it's not about us, basically. It's not, the, it's not um, selfish. It, it's about others. It's about your fellow human beings, brothers, whether they're your brothers in faith or equals in humanity. Absolutely. So I like the way you brought it is that at the end of the day, if I'm going to work harder to earn more, it's not because I want to keep it in my pocket. It's to contribute and help others. Absolutely. And I think we can learn beautifully from Ahlul Bayt how they've put it in practice throughout their life. Absolutely. Beautiful point that you make here. And this is really what it is all about. We should all be well off. We should all have the ability, for example, give $1 million in charity a year. We should do that. And why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why would God not give us this? If we're doing the right thing and we're helping and supporting cause. In fact, I would argue that if you give more, Allah will give you more in your life. There's no doubt about I've it. I've seen it. The, I'm a believer of that. I've and the Quran it. tells us this, the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam tell, tell us this, that when you start giving, you will, uh, you will start noticing better in your life, happiness and contentment in your lives. But to answer your question about who should you work for, there was a man during the time of Mount Sadiq Ali Salam, we were told, who was a tailor by trade. He was a very good tailor. And people would come to him and, you know, they'd pay to get their clothing tailored and things like this. Imam Ali Musalam had heard that he had stopped doing his work. He had stopped, you know, doing his, his craft, his trade. And he was just, he wasn't doing it anymore. So the Imam summoned him and he wanted to have a conversation. He says, um, I've heard that you were a very good tailor and you had a very good business. But you stopped doing it. Can I ask why? And, you know... Beautiful point. Ahlul Bayt al would never judge, uh, jump to conclusions. You know, they would always try to hear every side of the story. He says, "Yabna Rasulillah, Alhamdulillah, I have done really well in my business. I've done very well economically. I've made, en made enough money. I don't have any debt. I don't have any loans that I need to pay off. Everything's paid off. I'm fine on that front. Also, the amount of money that I have left, I believe it's enough to keep me till the end of my life." Maybe he thinks he has five, ten years left in his life. He says, I have enough to keep me till the end of my life. Essentially, he had retired. That's the word we would use in the modern era. He's where he had retired. Imam Ali Musalam said, I ask you to continue your work and continue striving in business and do not necessarily work for yourself, rather work for those who are dependent on you. And never become dependent on them. It's a big statement Imam Ali is saying. In essence, he's saying that as long as your hands and feet are moving and your mind is working, keep working. Someone may argue, Sayyidina, um, let's say this man, he worked for pretty much most part of his life. And as you said, he got five, ten years left. Is it wrong for him to want to retire? Maybe, okay. Um, let's say in a scenario, let's say he, his son could have taken over if he had a son, for example, mm. or he could have given the business to someone else to continue mm. or teach him at least the, the techniques to keep the quality. Mm. Doesn't that man have the right to say, you know what, I've worked my entire life, I've done this, I've established it. Now I just want to relax a bit and just, okay, continue my ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I don't want to work. Would that be wrong? It's a very good question, very important one. I remember I lectured on this notion uh, somewhere some time ago that there's a study, I mentioned this study in one of my lectures that has found that people who retire early and they do what's called a stagnant retirement. Stagnant retirement is the one where you're just, you know, you're just hanging out. 
pretty much. Stagnant retirement is different from an active retirement where, for example, I may retire from my job or whatever, and then I begin a new business, for example, a new endeavor, a new journey till the end of my life. Oh, okay. You know, sometimes, for example, people, because of the world that we live in mm. and the structure of it, you know, we're modern, uh, you know, industrial slaves, if you will, you know, in oh, some cool. sense. Yeah. And so they have to work up to a certain point to get a pension, for example, or, you know, something like this. And then after that, they begin a project. That's different. That's good. But sometimes people, they just begin to relax totally. And studies have found that people who do this type of retirement, stagnant retirement, they lose years off of their life. They don't live as long. SubhanAllah, I mentioned this in my lecture. After that, one of my friends came up to me and said, you know, I did, had no idea you were going to mention this study because I saw this in real life when I worked for a company called AARP, which we have in the United States, which is a pension company, essentially. And he said, I would notice that when people retired early and they didn't do anything, they sat at home, watched TV, didn't do anything, they died sooner. Subhanallah. Studies have found that people who retire, for every year you retire early, you shave one month off of your life. When you have worked, you have a structure in your life. You have a goal in your life. You have a mission in your life. These are very important things to keep you working throughout your life. And therefore, the Imam Ali Musalam says, keep working as long as you can. The ability to work in itself is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A tremendous blessing. It's an opportunity. How many people don't have the ability to work? And when you don't have the, uh, the ability to work, physically or mentally, Islam is the first one to provide you with a pension. The very famous story of Imam Amir al-Mu'mini, Ali ibn Abdullah al that when he was in Kufa, and he saw that man, the Christian man who had become blind, who was not able to work anymore, and he was begging in the street, Ali ibn Abi Talib, his, his justice couldn't take it. He said, what's going on here? Why is this man begging in the street? They said, he's not able to work anymore physically. He's not able to. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, we used him. That is, we used his abilities. His physical abilities, his mind, while he was able to work. And now that he's not physically able to work, we, we, just dash, we, him. we dash him, we abandon him. No way. I will not move from here. Until he is given a pension from the Baytul Mal. This is how Islam operates. Total balance. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how our lives are supposed to be. In light of Islam. And until we get there, we won't be satisfied. We need to, be under, we need to understand that rather than focusing on getting a really nice house and nice car and all those things, although they're halal, I'm not saying they're haram at all. But our focus should be developing us locally, then nationally, then globally. And develop and help our brothers and sisters throughout the world. Now through Ahlul Bayt, how can we extract the knowledge through them, these holy personalities, with regards to this economic development, from both uh, uh, macro and micro? Beautiful point. So how can we, what, what, what examples do we have from the Ahlul Bayt on development? I'll, I'll share one that's attributed to our sixth Imam Sadiq alayhi salam where we are told that Imam Ali salam gave a loan of 1,700 dinars to a man. The Imam said, I want you to take this money, I want you to take this wealth, I want you to take this income and build a business with it. Tying this in with what we talked about last week. Or so it's like an episode. investment basically. He basically invested in him. He said, here's the capital, you don't have the money? Okay, here's the money, I'm giving you the money. Establish a business, start a business. The man went and he started a business. After some time, alhamdulillah, his business became established. The man himself, he made a 100 dinar profit. So he invested, the imam invested 1700 dinar. The man said, on top of the 1700, I've made 100 dinar of profit. And he said, Yabna Rasulullah, he came to the imam, he said, this is for you. Imam Ali Muslim said, no. You take that, you keep it, and you invest it back into the business. You take that, invest it back into the capital, invest it back in the business. This is how you build a strong company, by the way. Sometimes people get the profits and they start spending right away. Nice car, nice house, let me buy everything right away. A smart, prudent business person, they take their profits, they begin to invest it back in the business to grow the business. This is what Jeff Bezos did, for example, with Amazon. 
playing the long game to make sure that he kept investing back in. Anyways, the Imam said that 100 the, the dinar, no, I don't want it. I want you to put that back in the company. And the Imam says a very important thing. He says, when he gave the loan, he said that I, my goal in giving you this money is not to profit, not to make money. Although, Imam Ali Musalam is attributed to have said, although seeking profit is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It all starts from the intention at the end of the day. Subhanallah. It starts with the intention. What do you want that profit for? What do you want that profit for? If it's to support your family, your friends, in, in your neighbors and surroundings, why not? This is a very good thing. That I remember a time we were told where the Lady of Light, Fatima Zahra Salam was was doing was praying, was doing du'a after a prayer. And we are told that her sons, Imam Hassan Ali Salam, heard the du'as. And of course, these are all narrations and stories for us to understand. Of course. For us to learn from it's in not our like lives. they were in need of it. No, of course they were not in need. And they, they were fully aware. But he says, my mother, I heard you praying for <coughs> everyone. But what about us? Yeah. You didn't pray for the house? Or not, at the, not until the very end, for example? Like, yeah. And she says, Ya Bunaya, ajar thumma dar. That first the neighbors, then the house. A very important principle. I may think I'm content for myself and my family, but Islam says, hold on a second. You jump straight away to yourself to look at if whether you're content individually. You should have first started looking at your neighbors and, and those around you. Or is every, every one of their needs met first and then you? It's very important to note. Because we may be miss the big picture. The Ahlul Bayt Ali Muslim Rasulullah himself says, one who is not concerned with the umur al-Muslimin, the concern, the affairs of the Muslim, Muslim. That person is not a Muslim. It's a very important statement. If I'm not concerned about it's Muslims, if I'm not, and going back to the tradition that you alluded to of Amir Mu'mineen, that you either equal in faith, brother in humanity, brother in faith, equal in humanity, then that means that I must be concerned for Muslims and non-Muslims. You know, the tradition about my neighbors didn't say Muslim or non-Muslim. Of course. There were Christians and Jews living in, in, uh, in during Islam during the in the Arabian Peninsula. Even an atheist, at the Even end of the day, he's your equal in humanity. Absolutely, and we subject must subject to him not being an open enemy of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Sure. Of course. And these are all very important things. The Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam did this. So, but going back to Imam As Sadiq, Imam As Sadiq said, "I don't want profit from this, although profit is a good thing." The man made a one hundred dinar profit. Imam Ali Musalam said, "Invest that back in the company." He invested it back in the company. After some time, the man died. He passed away. When he passed away, we're told that Imam Ali Musalam sent a message to his son. He sent condolences to the, to the young man. And he said, he sent the message that there was a loan of 1,700 dinar that was given to your father. And a man by the name of, a companion by the name of Umar bin Yazid knows about this. He's aware of this. Make sure that that is given to them. The young man says, I went back to my father's desk and dresser and drawer and I saw his ledger, if you will. And it said, there is an amount of 1700 that has been given by Imam al-Sadiq. 100 profit was made on it. Imam Ali Musalam said, invest that back in. And he said that these companions, these two individuals know about this matter. This this tells us something, this tradition or this narration tells us some very important lessons. Number one, Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam were the most generous people. No there are numerous that. traditions that tell us that when the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam would give, they would know, and people would try to give them back sometimes what they gave, they said, Us Ahlul Bayt, once we give, we never take back. And this is the absolute truth, there's no doubt about it. When the Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam gave, they would never take back. So why did Imam al-Sadiq say that this loan has been given, I need you to ensure that this loan is given back, perhaps to pass it on to other people, to give loans to other people. He's given a principle. And this, it, when you align this with Muhammad Yunus, for example, what we were talking about in previous episodes, about micro-loans and micro-financing and help people get on their own feet, people don't want charity. They want opportunity. Charity is a temporary bandage. It's something that just covers the wound temporarily. The Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam have a very important principle that they give us forward here. When they come forward and they say that you need to look at the global picture. So they said that 
give a loan, but make sure you get it back so you can pass that loan on to someone else and develop more houses and develop more households and more businesses. Not just one. You're able to develop multiple. Now, how does, uh, I wanted to ask you the, the, the fact that you mentioned about loans. It's quite crucial. With regards to loans, what's the conditions in order for a loan to be halal? When you give a loan, what's the strains where it comes along yes. with it? Is, it? is it permissible for me to give you a loan and expect an interest? Mm. Because someone can um, come and argue that interest is riba. Mm. Um, so what, 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 what's the condition of, of a loan? to be within the halal principle, like, for example, you give the example of uh, the imam. Mm. Yeah, I didn't hear from you saying that the imam would ask uh, interest in return. Very good. And of course, there was no expectation of interest. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Or, or riba. Riba, as is translated, would be exorbitant amounts of interest. This is a very important point to make. And, and to answer your question, the proper way to do it in Islamic contracts is the way the gentleman who took the loan from the imam did it. He wrote everything down in a ledger and made sure it was transparent and there was a record for it. Not like some people sometimes in, in the modern world, so you get a, give them a loan, you have no expectation that they'll ever give it back to you. It says, fi amanillah, it's gone. Justice is on both sides. The person who's taking that loan must be very honest and make sure that they give it back. When they have the means to do so, and or as per the agreed terms and conditions. Does the one who's giving the loan have a right to demand an increase? In terms of that, the person who who is giving that loan, at that point in time, they are not to, for example, ask for any interest. Now, in terms of interest, what is interest? This is something that the scholars and the jurists will this is a fiqh issue that they debate on and discuss on. But what riba was exorbitant amounts of interest. Now, that means maybe 30-40% these numbers. And this is what was going on in Mecca with loan sharks at that time. They were taking ridiculous amounts. And interest is really slavery in a sense. Because what it does is it cripples and it handcuffs and chains the person who is dealing with this. Because the amount ends up becoming compounded and it becomes a ridiculous amount that is unpayable. But... To give someone a gift may be a different story in a different scenario. We have many traditions with Ahlul Bayt, for example, if someone's employed, for example, and you set a, an agreed wage, right? Yeah. So, for example, I'm going to work for you, you say that I'll give you 10 pounds an hour, for example. I work one hour for you. A follower of the Ahlul Bayt always sticks to the terms of the agreement, but a true follower of the Ahlul Bayt, the Ahlul Bayt themselves tell us, give a little bit extra, give something extra, for example. That person, when they give you a loan, there's a real cost that is incurred to them. That cost is the opportunity cost of the money. In the modern world, they call this the time value of money. The time value of money is this notion that what could I have done in that one year of time? Had I, had I not given you the money, I'd kept it myself. Further than this, there's inflation. If, for example, you give me a loan of $100 today, you give me a $100 loan today, mm. I give you $100 back in one year. Mm. Did I give you the same amount of money? Some would argue no. I gave you maybe $96, $97, $95, maybe less than that. The reason is because the prices have gone up. Yesterday, last year, bread was 50 pence or 50 cents. Now it's 60. Prices go up. So I didn't give you exactly the same. So it may be a good idea to that person who gave you the loan, maybe just, maybe just take that, that loan that they gave you. If you do well, alhamdulillah, make sure you try to give them a little bit of a gift back. Thank you for this. But that person should not ask for riba or interest and say that, no, I want 20, 30, 40% for giving you this loan. That's not acceptable at all in Islam. That is not. And so this is the concept of development in light of the Ahlul Bayt salam To work together, Develop one house, then move it on to the next and help people and develop a community and develop a society to thrive at the highest level. Ahsantum, inshallah. Well said. And uh, said now, unfortunately, uh, we've come uh, once again to the end uh, of uh, our show. Inshallah, we'll continue tomorrow. Inshallah. Hopefully, um, on, uh, upon the same topic with regards to wealth, and we can expand even further. Uh, I would like to thank you all, my uh, brothers, sisters, respective viewers. Uh, for being with us and I truly hope that uh, this program has been as beneficial for you as it has been for us uh, in the meanwhile um, stay tuned um, there should be Ahkam SOS coming up and always please do remember us in your du'as and
pray for the reappearance, the hastening of the reappearance of Imam Al-Hujjaj, Allah Ta'ala, Farjah Al-Sharif. From all of us, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.